Let's go to our sermon time. Let me ask you to open your Bibles, please, to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 6. 1 Corinthians, chapter 6. First Corinthians chapter 6, and let's read two verses there, verses 9 and 10. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Today I call this sermon, When a Christian Sins. No matter how long you have believed in Jesus Christ, you never outgrow the problem of sin. It's a weakness in your flesh. It's a temptation that is ever-present. Something in your flesh, something in your old nature is always working against that part of you that wants to please God now. Let me say, it's generally true that the temptations that come to the mind of a 90-year-old man probably aren't the same ones that would have come to a, the mind of a 20-year-old man or a 30, 40, maybe 50-year-old man. But the, the thought, the possibility of doing something wrong that he knows he shouldn't, doesn't go away. We believe in the eternal security of a true believer in Jesus Christ. We believe that once you're saved, you're always saved. You don't do the saving, God does the saving. You can't keep it, God has to be in charge of keeping it. All you can do is the trusting. Let me say at the very outset this morning, most public speakers, including preachers, try to organize their points so that they build up to what they think is the most important point near the end. Now, I don't know that I'm very good at that. I probably am not. But let me offer what I think is the most important point for you to take away from this sermon today, right at the start, and we'll move on from there. This is actually a very wonderful text on the eternal security of every Christian. It really is. Now, the Pentecostal brethren will immediately protest. They'll, they'll talk about some Christian they know who is engaged in any number of these things, and it says that in the text, shall not inherit the kingdom of God, so obviously they must have lost their salvation. And Paul lists some terrible groups, fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, abusers of themselves, of mankind, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners, at least ten horrible groups. But he continues in verse 11. And such were some of you. Past tense. But ye, Christians, are washed. But ye are sanctified. But ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And my point is this. The Lord makes a fine distinction in the Bible between Christians who may commit those things and the unsaved who are those things. They are thieves. They are drunkards. They are fornicators and so forth. The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. It says in our text here in verse 9. But if you're saved, you now possess the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. You're heading for, quote, an inheritance, incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. 1 Peter 1, verse 4. 
the Apostle John states this point in such a way that it completely baffles modern-day Christians who don't believe their Bible. He writes, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, God's seed, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. 1 John 3, verse 9. But who's kidding who? Of course the believer still sins. I still sin, and I know I'm not alone in the world, so I know all of you still sin. The person sitting next to you still sins. And everybody knows we still sin. Let's not fool ourselves. Paul says, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Romans 7, verse 18. Jesus' words, or rather John's words, about the Christian being incapable of sinning have to be understood in light of a, a doctrine known as, the, as spiritual circumcision regarding the body and the soul. That's another subject, however, for another time. But the first point is that God most certainly distinguishes between the actions of the saved and the actions of the unsaved, and he categorizes them separately. Now, that was all introduction. Let me get to the sermon. My first outline point is this. You don't have license to sin. And what I mean by that is you don't have permission to sin just because you're kept secure <clears throat> by Jesus Christ. Eternal security doesn't let you do whatever you want. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. There's the security. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. Well, I'm sure glad he does. I'm sure glad that once I became a child of God, November 5th, 1967, he's known me, and he knows I belong to him ever since that moment. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. 2 Timothy 2, verse 19. John says, These things write I unto you, that ye sin not. 1 John 2, verse 1. Paul asks, What then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Is it okay for me to sin just to prove that I'm still kept saved and I can't lose my salvation? And he answers his own question. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? In Romans 6, verses 1 and 2. I once had a Pentecostal preacher tell me to my face, you Baptists, you believe once saved, always saved. You think you can go out and do whatever you want to do without, without any consequence because you keep your salvation. And I told him, out of all the preachers I'd ever heard in my life, and I grew up as a preacher's kid, so we met a lot of ministers, heard a lot of sermons over the years. I said, I never heard one man say such a ridiculous thing in my life. We certainly believe in consequences for sin, not only in this life, but in the next life. You don't have a license or permission to commit sin if you're a Christian. Secondly, let me say this. Understand the definitions of sin. Some people want to make their own definitions for sin. They think that, well, real sinning is what the other guy is doing, but not me. Or that what they're engaged in is just a little bit bad, but it's not nearly as bad as something else or somebody else. The Bible says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. 1 John 3, verse 4. Most people accept at least the Ten Commandments as the law of God. And nobody's ever kept all the Ten Commandments perfectly. So, get on 
the internet someday. I don't normally recommend anything from the internet because there's a lot of poison out there, but check out one of our missionaries, Jason Hines' video where he's talking to the man on the street in Quebec, up in Canada. He asked somebody, can you name any of the Ten Commandments? Nobody can. Well, how many different brands of beer can you name? Oh, about 32, you know. So people not only don't, don't keep the Ten Commandments perfectly, many people don't even know what they are. There are also sins of omission, failing to act. God told the Jews that if they saw their neighbor's oxen or ass, some beast of burden, wandering off or struggling to carry the weight, that uh, they were to help that animal, even if that neighbor was their enemy. In Exodus 23, verses 4 and 5, James writes, Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. James 4, verse 17. Sin isn't just doing bad. Sin is failing to do good when you know you should and you have opportunity to do good. There are also sins of the mind. You recall Christ preached about whosoever or looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart, Matthew 5, verse 28. Isaiah 55, verse 7 says, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. The Bible says, The thought of foolishness is sin, and the scorner is an abomination to men. Proverbs 24, verse 9. Do you, as a Christian, ever have foolish thoughts? Do you ever imagine doing something illegal, unholy, unbecoming of a Christian, even if you don't carry it out, even if you don't do it. Listen, when I see some of the rottenness and the wickedness corrupting society, I've been unable to fall asleep because I was thinking of devious ways to murder a few people. Now, I'm not going to, and, but I know I'm not alone in the world, and I know all of you have probably had similar thoughts. The Lord Jesus said, For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh, in Matthew 12, verse 34. So King David told God, Thy word have I hid in mine heart, why? That I might not sin against thee, Psalm 119, verse 11. The definitions of sin cover much more than just the Ten Commandments. And you, as a Christian, are supposed to know that. Point number three, remember the results of sin. Sin can break your fellowship with God and with the brethren. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. 1 John 1, verse 6. However, verse 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. When you quit sinning as a believer in Jesus Christ, then fellowship with God can be restored, and true fellowship with other Christians is then possible. Two people who say that they're knit together by the Holy Spirit and the same saving grace of Jesus Christ, and yet one person secretly getting away with some rotten sin, something that's completely uh, against Jesus Christ, he and that other Christian are not going to get along and have perfect fellowship because they're not in harmony. Can two walk together except they be agreed, the Bible asks? No. Both Christians have to be working towards the same goal if they want to have true fellowship with one another. They both have to be seeking to please Jesus Christ with their life with their talents, with their abilities, with their speech. And every element of their lives ought to be given over and surrendered to whatever God wants to do with it. Otherwise, you have no true fellowship. Don't you want that kind of fellowship with the brethren? 
those people who are your real friends. I don't mean your Facebook friends, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down. I'm not that kind of crap. Those people aren't friends. You don't even know them. They don't know you. But try to quit sinning and start living right and see if things don't fall into place as they ought to. But sin also hinders your prayers. Turn, if you will, back to Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah chapter 59. In verses 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Obviously, God hears everything, but he's not obligated to respond. When you, as a Christian, willfully and knowingly commit sin, I know several things about you. Number one, you've stopped praying to God with any kind of regularity as you used to do. You don't want to talk to God because being in His presence might convict you. Number two, You've stopped reading your Bible the way you might have read it before. Because being around his words might convict you. Thirdly, you enjoy giving in to the flesh. The will of God isn't important to you any longer. You think your will is better or is wiser and smarter than God's will for you. And you start keeping your distance from other Christians who are trying to do right. Because you get convicted when you're around them. But God's not obligated to hear and answer your prayers until you fix the problem of sin that's standing in the way between you and God. And remember, you also reap what you sow. Turn forward in the New Testament to the book of Galatians, chapter 6. Galatians, chapter 6. And these verses should be committed to memory by every Christian. Verses 7 and 8. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Even if you're saved and you're eternally secure as a believer, you can still become a candidate for VD and herpes and any uh, number of sick diseases if you're out there fornicating. Being saved doesn't exempt you from the consequences that come from sin. You can still damage your body if you start smoking cigarettes. Now they say, what, but even vaping or e-cigarettes, whatever, that, that's supposed to damage your health too. You can ruin your health if you start drinking. You can lose your friends if you start lying. You can lose your job if you start stealing or cheating your company. And you should know that if you plant one kernel of corn in the ground, it may grow into a stalk that has three, four, five ears of corn on it. And each one of those ears has hundreds of kernels. The consequences, the results of sin are always greater than you think they're going to be, than you anticipate them to be. Fourthly, I want you to consider the harm done by sin. The harm done 
when a Christian sins. When you sin, you hurt the name of Christ. The Lord Jesus asked his enemies, which of you convinceth me of sin? There in John 8, verse 46. And of course, they had nothing to say. They couldn't cite a single example of him sinning or a single incident. The dying thief on the cross who repented said to the other one, we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man, Christ, hath done nothing amiss. There in Luke 23, verse 41. When he read the scriptures in the synagogue, the Bible says, And all bear him witness, and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. Luke 4, verse 22. The Bible says of Christ, Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, 1 Peter 2, verse 22. He wasn't deceiving anyone, and Peter was an eyewitness to Christ's life. We read that when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, 1 Peter 2, verse 23. Christ was not looking for payback for those people who were falsely accusing him. The Bible says that Christ was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews 4, verse 15. If you're a Christian, your life is supposed to reflect the life of Jesus Christ. And there should be an amen on what I just said. Let me try that again. If you're a Christian, your life is supposed to reflect the life of Jesus Christ. That still wasn't loud enough. Come on, the, the, this microphone might not pick it up as sufficiently as you, but let's try that again. If you're a Christian, your life is supposed to reflect the life of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. But when you sin, you hinder unsaved people from turning to Jesus Christ. When I went to Bible school, we had a guy in my class and of all, wouldn't you know, he's the only other student from California beside me. And uh, I'm going to talk about, I'm not going to mention his name, but he kind of wandered off and stopped serving the Lord. But in preaching class, we had to write outlines on different subjects. Brother Jew understands that because he went through the same thing. We had to write outlines on different types of sermons, biographical and expository and so forth. And then we tried, we had to preach in front of each other. Every time he wrote a sermon outline, his illustrations all revolved around drinking, alcohol. Somebody saw him riding his motorcycle down the highway in Pensacola with a six pack bungee corded on the back of his motorcycle. And he seemed to have the idea that he could go to a bar and drink with the unsaved people and then try to witness to them while he's drinking with them. It doesn't work out that way. It doesn't work out that way any more than you can fornicate with somebody and then say, I'm going to give that person a track or witness to them that I just fornicated with. It doesn't work that way. God doesn't let it work that way. You know what you end up doing? You end up damning that person's soul to hell because of your hypocrisy. You're a hypocrite. You can't say, God saved me from a life of sin and rebellion and disobedience and now that I am saved from those things, I'm going to go back and rebel and be disobedient. God doesn't let it work out that way. Paul writes, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers. And then he tells us how. In word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. 1 Timothy 4. Verse 12, but you damage, you hurt the reputation, the name of Jesus Christ when you sin as a Christian. You also hurt the Holy Spirit. We read, and grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Ephesians 4, verse 30. If you're a Christian, a true believer, the Holy Spirit lives inside your body. He's not some impersonal, neutral force. 
He has personality and he has feelings that can be hurt and offended if the truth be known. By your sin as a Christian. Now, one final thing and I'm done today. As a Christian, when you sin, you hurt the brethren. You hurt the brethren. Paul writes, and whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. And then he says, now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 26 and 27. Because we're joined together collectively in the body of Jesus Christ. Together we make up the bride of Jesus Christ. We make up the church of Jesus Christ. If I start sinning, I'm going to ruin your image by association. If your great-great-grandfather's brother was Adolf Hitler... I'll venture to say you've probably changed your last name since then, right? Because you don't want the association. And you hurt the image, you hurt the testimony of others who are associated with you. About 30 years ago, maybe a little more than that, America had to deal with a bunch of TV preachers who were reading dirty magazines and getting pulled over for drunk driving and fooling around with prostitutes and begging for so much money and wasting it on so many things. You know, Jimmy Swaggart and Jim Baker, that guy seemed more like a queer anyway, and Paul Crouch, who was a queer, uh, and, the, and he and his wife Jan paid themselves about a million dollars a year, and they had something like 24, 25 houses maintained throughout the United States for their own comfort whenever they would travel for TBN. But when these pre preachers started to fall back around the 1980s, the rest of Christianity, all true believers, had to pick up the pieces. Suddenly, all Christians got lumped together with these money grabbers, these fornicators, these perverts, and so forth. Everyone who was unsafe thought, well, maybe all Christians must be like that. All they ever do is ask for money. And then when they get the money, they misspend it. They waste it. You make it hard for the brethren to live a clean life and a godly life and a life pleasing to the Lord Jesus Christ when you're out sinning because you're knit together. You're associated with each other. I don't want to hurt your reputation. Why would you hurt my reputation? Why would you do that to me or to the other brethren by sinning? And then saying, I go to such and such church, so-and-so is my pastor. If you're out there doing any number of godless things, and we won't go into a list today, don't tell them where you go to church. Don't mention my name as your pastor. When a Christian sins, he still has this promise, however. If we confess our sins, us Christians... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, verse 9. Boy, thank God for that. Even if you sin as a Christian, the Bible says there's something you can do about it. Thank God for that. Now, you can damage and you can lose a number of things as a Christian who sins. But you can't lose your salvation. I thank the Lord for that. I'm, I'm glad that I'm kept saved by the power of Jesus Christ. Therefore, I want to keep myself serving him as purely and as uh, perfectly as I possibly can with his strength and his help.